Hi everyone and welcome back to another Jam Canada video. If this is your first time on my channel, thank you so much for clicking on this video and I hope you stick around for more. I cover all the murder, the mysteries, and the mayhem that go on here in Canada. And as a friendly reminder, I do try to do the best research I possibly can before ever posting any of my videos. However, the nature of these videos does mean I do rely on news outlets, speculation from investigators, police and court documents, things from journalists, family members, and any other things that I can find that are public. With that being said, sometimes information in the media is portrayed wrong and um, I do do my best to obviously filter that out, but I am human so um, if I do say anything that is false information, please correct me in the comments. But I do ask that you please um, put your sources as well so that we're not spreading more information, more misinformation around. Thank you so much. And like I always say, I always encourage everyone to do their own research and come to their own conclusions for that be anything in your life. But especially these cases, because I am a strong believer in questioning everything. So... Um, before we do dive in, I do want to make a specific trigger warning um, because this video is going to be talking about a four-year-old boy that went missing. Um, and I understand that children cases are very sensitive to some people, um, especially even myself. So if this video is not for you or you cannot handle this a type of video or a video like this, um, please click out and I hope I see you again. So today I'm going to be talking about the case of a beautiful four-year-old boy that seems to have just vanished into the spring air and never to be heard from again. The story is from 1975, so I do want to stress the age of this case. This story does take place in the Toronto metropolitan area, so just before I dive in, I want to clarify the area um, for you that don't live in Toronto or aren't familiar with that, with Ontario. Um, Toronto is a metropolitan area. It has six cities in the area, which is um, sometimes referred to as the six. So when I mention the different areas in this story, it sounds like they're completely different cities, which they are, but they are all in the Toronto metropolitan area, which I do understand is confusing to some people, but um, I will put up pictures alongside along with my story as I usually do so that you guys can get a very good idea as to what the area actually looks like uh, just from a map. So on March 31st, 1971, a beautiful couple named Jerry and Barbara March, who were in their mid-20s, gave birth to a beautiful blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby boy who they named Cameron Gerald Mark, who was nicknamed Cammy. They adored and cared for Cameron just as much as any parents would do and tried to give him the best possible life that they could give him. In 1975, the little family was living in Burlington, Ontario, in a quiet rural area in a bungalow style home, surrounded by local farms, fields, ponds, and also a sand and gravel pit. Um, basically the typical Ontario farmland. Now by 1975, Cameron was now four years old, three foot tall and a happy, innocent little boy, just enjoying his life. He had braces on the lower left side of his teeth and he had gold caps that shine when he smiled. He also had one discolored tooth in the upper front that made him just a little bit more unique. On Wednesday, May 7th, 1975, it was just another beautiful spring day in Burlington, Ontario. Jerry was off to his office in Mississauga, which was about a 30 minute commute for his day of work while Barbara and Cameron enjoyed their day at home. At around 3 p.m., Cameron wanted to enjoy the sunny day that was set out for him. So he asked his mother if he could go across the street to his, to his friend's house to play. Barbara agreed since this was nothing new and she could very easily watch him from her from her kitchen window since it was directly facing the neighbor's yard and house. So little Cameron was dressed in a little white shirt with a green collar and monkeys climbing on the front, rust brown corduroy pants and spunky brown desert boots walked a little ways across the street to his friend's house to play. Barbara watched him as he did and then watched as he played with the other kids in, on a swing set in the yard and Barbara would frequently look out the window um, to check up on him. And at 3.15, she did so again like usual and seen that he was playing. But the next minute she checked the window and she could not see him playing. 
At first she tried not to panic and she thought maybe he was playing in the bush, maybe the kids were playing hide and seek, something anything logical like that, but soon her motherly instincts let her know that there was something seriously wrong. She walked over to the neighbor's house and went to go find him and, and the neighbors that owned the property told her that they had told Cameron that his friend who lived at the house was going to take a nap or was already napping. There was um, two different stories I kept getting from news articles. So either his friend was already napping or he was going to take a nap. Um, either way, Cameron was informed of this and he turned around to go back home. And that's the last the neighbors seen of him. So upon hearing this, Barbara was instantly frantic, of course. Um, she immediately started looking all over for him. And she even dove into a ditch next to her home just in case he might have fallen in. Uh, when she couldn't find him, she ended up calling upon all her other neighbors. And of course the police and fire um, who did respond with urgency and were there before but who and who were there by 4.30 p.m. Now, of course, Barbara tried to contact her husband, Jerry, but unfortunately that specific day, um, Jerry had been out working at the CNE grounds in Toronto. He, so he didn't find out that his son was missing until he got back to his office in Mississauga later that day. Once Jerry got back to his office and got the word that his son was missing, he immediately drove the 30 minutes home with every minute feeling like an eternity. By the time Jerry arrived back home, there was already a swarm of volunteers and police searching for his son. He wasted no time and immediately joined in with the search as well. So the police set up a command post in Jerry and Barbara's yard and by the next morning there was over 125 people who had reportedly shown up to volunteer and search for Cameron. Now by the next morning on May 8th, locals would read about Cameron missing in the local newspaper while reading it at breakfast, which would basically be the equivalent of opening Facebook and seeing that he is missing in today's day and age. Now also on the morning of May 8th, the Ontario Provincial Police also known as OPP, had joined in on the search. So at this point, the community was doing everything they possibly could to aid in the search at some way. Um, some even made sandwiches, cakes, coffees, teas, and things just to fuel the searchers' tireless efforts in finding Cameron Gerald Marsh. So George Moore of Halton Regional Police was in charge of the operation, and he asked the community of up to a 30-kilometer radius to look for any clues that may provide any kind of detail as to the whereabouts to Cameron. Now on May 10th, Jerry March gave an interview with the spectator and pleaded for the return of his son, stating, all they have to do is phone somebody, anybody, and tell them where he was left off and we can go get him. And at the same time, there was also a small reward put up. So the search continued and was also ramped up with helicopters, dogs, and divers searching the deep ponds while the OPP dragged the ponds from north to south and then from east to west. Also on May 10th, the police made a statement saying they are looking for information about a white car that was seen near the intersection of Calling Road and Blind Line on the afternoon of Cameron's disappearance. At the same time as asking hundreds of more volunteers to aid in the search. The next day on May 11th, Jerry wasted no time and reached out to the television and radio stations to make another desperate plea where he stated, I'm sure by now people have seen him, his picture or something. Phone the police or anything. Please just leave the boy anywhere populated and call someone with his location. We won't even press charges. We just want our boy back. Now come May 14th, the search efforts were still going very strong and the police made another statement saying that they are still trying to make contact with the driver of the white car, which was seen parked at the corner of blind line and calling row near the marsh's home shortly after the disappearance now of course i did try to find out if they were able if they were ever able to make contact with the person driving the white car but i personally was unable to find any information related to that subject so a few more days passed with full search efforts being implemented but on may 20th the Burlington Gazette newspaper reported that the search efforts were being reduced. 
with 10,000 acres of land being searched, a thousand volunteers and police officers, helicopters, search dogs, divers, even grid searching. All efforts had been exhausted and the search was narrowed to just a few specific areas. So the next day on May 21st, a Burlington investor named Paul Thomas uh, put up a $10,000 reward and another Burlington businessman who was unnamed put up another 5,000, bringing the reward money to $15,000. Or in 2021, that would have been equal to around $70,000. This was one of those cases that touched anyone's hearts who read about it. And it also made a lot of people want to be involved. But of course, some wanted to be involved a little too much. A uh, clairvoyant had come out and made a statement saying that she sensed the boy to be alive, although she could not pinpoint his exact location. And in my personal opinion, this stuff does a lot more harm than good, unless the family is personally seeking it out and looking for that. I don't think coming out and making public statements and things like that about seeing visions of where a missing person is really does any good to be honest so then a few days later the toronto star reported a 64 year old dentist named dr harold mason who was said to dabble in the occult which is basically people who believe in the supernatural mystical magical beliefs phenomena and possibly um practice it as well um he said that cameron had been killed and thrown off a cliff I really didn't find much else about that um, because I wasn't able to find more about it. My personal opinion is that they looked into that and realized that this guy was just talking, just talking nonsense. And upon my research, I also found a whole webpage, which obviously is more from more recent years, but it was of someone trying to use astrology to find Cameron Marsh, which was very interesting to read, but So clearly, even to this day, this case captivates a lot of people in a certain way. And another downfall to cases like this that are very public and out there that have a heart-wrenching story to go along with it, along with reward money, slimy people try to take advantage of that. In the summer of 1975, the Marsh family was also victims of extortion. Michael Higgins, a young man from Burlington, demanded $20,000 for the safe return of Cameron, which I believe was done through the newspaper. Obviously, this was all made up and he was later arrested and sentenced to two years in jail for the attempted extortion of the Marsh family. I did try to find more information out about this as well, but I was unsuccessful. As time went on, there was absolutely no evidence at all as to where Cameron went on that spring day, but Jerry and Barbara have never stopped searching for their son. Later on in years, in 1981, the family did decide to relocate to Perry Sound, but they wanted to make it very clear that this was not to start a new life, but a different life. They did go on to have another son, which they were very blessed to raise, and they went on to also have grandchildren. But along with all the blessings later on, the heartache of Cameron going missing was still always in the back of their heads and hearts. But with all that heartache they endured, they still never fell apart, which is often a very common thing in cases like this. Jerry and Barbara went on to beat the odds, were happily married for 53 years. Unfortunately, Barbara passed away on March 18th, 2019, at the age of 73, never getting to know what happened to her baby boy. Jerry said that his last words to his wife were, find the boy, and he now wonders if she knows more than he does. Now, I didn't know where to exactly add this next part, but the search for Cameron actually overlapped a search operation in the area that was carried out about eight years prior in 1967, when a 10-year-old girl named Marianne Chouette went missing after last being seen outside her school, uh, Kilbride Public School, 
and was seen on her way home where she only lived 400 meters away. Uh, she was last seen speaking to a white male who was sitting in a vehicle that was later to be reported as a dark blue or black with chrome across the back Renault stash re station wagon. Now, this man was obviously later believed to be Marianne's abductor. Now, this man was never named or I wasn't able to personally find his name, um, but it was found and confirmed that he had been jailed a few years after Marianne's disappearance in 1972 for the attempted abduction of a 17-year-old girl in Burlington. And the same suspect was also being investigated for an alleged essay of two Ancaster girls, aged three and nine, between 1971 and 1978. Now, shortly after this man was confronted about the assault and the disappearance, disappearance of Marianne, he soon after took his own life, leading us to never have the answers to I'm sure a ton of questions that could have possibly had answers to. So now it's been 46 years and Cameron's case is still active, but there has been no updates. And Jerry, Cameron's dad, still keeps up with the case to this day, calling the investigators and seeing if there's any news or updates, anything new at all. Unfortunately, we know as much as we knew back then as we know today, which is basically nothing. But on a lighter note, two retired police officers who worked on Marianne's case never gave up and never forgot about her. And early in this September, September 2021, an area where the searches overlapped was blocked off and extensively searched. Now they did not come back with any bones like they were hoping, but they did have some of the dirt samples sent off because there was confirmed to be body decay decomposition in them. I don't know how all of that works, obviously. Um, I haven't studied forensics, but, but obviously they were able to tell that the dirt did have body decomposition in it somehow, and so those dirt samples were sent off to a lab, which we don't have the results yet at the time of me filming this, um, but they could be released any day now. So it could even be released right after I film this video in between the editing and posting. And of course, if I have any information um, any updates with that, I will um, make a short video and update you guys. Now, with that being said, if the stuff they found comes back negative for Marianne, we can only hope that it will at least bring closure to another family whose loved one was missing or an, uh, some other unsolved case. But because the search areas were overlapped, I wouldn't say it would be wrong to speculate that they if it comes back negative for Marianne, they will possibly test it for Cameron, hopefully. Um, now, as far as I'm aware, there have been no age progression photos done with Cameron, um, which I know many people feel that there should be because there is a very high possibility that he is out there right now um, amongst all of us. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to cover this case. And another reason being that Jerry has always tried to keep this case in the public eye and he's tried to not let it fade into history, which I personally think he's done a good job of. So I felt that it was only right to make a modern day newspaper article, which would be a YouTube awareness video. Maybe with enough eyes being on the case and maybe enough um, attention being brought up that an a maybe an age progression photo will be done and and maybe that'll lead us to something we can only hope. Or maybe with so many years passing, maybe somebody knows something that they can finally let the authorities or the proper people know. Now, of course, if you have any information on the whereabouts of four-year-old Cameron Gerald March, who went missing May 7th, 1975 from Burlington, Ontario, who would have turned 50 years old this year on March 31st, please contact the Regional Investigative Services at 905-825-4747, extension 8760. You can also call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. You can also contact Halton Regional Police at 905-825-4777, extension 5082, Agency case number 
And that is basically all the information I was able to gather for this case um, for you guys today. Uh, I wanna thank you again so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening all the way through. It really truly means a lot to me. Um, if you appreciate this type of content, please give a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe so that I know that you guys are appreciating this content. Um, it gives me a little boost to also continue to make these videos. So yeah, thank you again and stay safe out there.